Hello everyone. Today we're studying the topic acceleration and relative motion. In this topic we'll be learning about vector algebra, so how to add and subtract vectors together, as well as how to measure motion from different frames of reference using vectors. We'll start with a section of vector algebra. Vector algebra might seem very complicated, like this blackboard here, but in fact it's not actually too hard to work with. You'll get used to it pretty quickly. Now, all of the motion that we have studied so far has been one-dimensional. So all displacements, velocities, and accelerations have been in one direction or the opposite direction. And there's been no sort of other component to any of the motions. Now, in a one-dimensional scenario, we always know the direction of motion, which is useful, because it makes the calculations very simple. Either something's positive or it's negative. There's no need to worry about other directions and axes. Now, in two or three dimensions, so, in the real world, we have to describe the direction of the motion. If you're trying to get through a maze, for example, using just positive and negative numbers won't really help you get through because you have to move in all four cardinal directions. Now, a vector quantity has both magnitude and direction. And so, we can use vectors to describe motion in higher, direct, uh, in higher dimensions. If we're just in one dimension, we can use scalars, which is simpler, but doesn't give as much information. Now in a diagram, as we know, vectors are represented by arrows. So just reviewing, the arrow's length represents the magnitude of the vector quantity. So this vector is bigger than this vector. And the arrow's direction points in the same direction as the vector. So these vectors, for example, are pointing in opposite directions. So how do we measure the angle of a vector? Well, in two dimensions, we can measure a vector's angle as a bearing. Uh, so, bearings are angles measured relative to compass directions, which you learn about in mathematics. So here we can see the bearing south 30 degrees east, at which we have a little object called A. And here we have a vector that's 10 meters long, that's at an angle of 120 degrees true, that is, 120 degrees east of north. We can also use angles of motion, or angles between objects, to measure angles, instead of bearings but in this section we'll just be using bearings instead. Now vectors add together in a very different way to scalars. We obviously already know how to add scalars, so 2 plus 3 is 5, and 1 kilogram plus 5 kilograms is 6 kilograms, and so on. But the, in the case of vectors, we, we have vector sums instead of regular sums. Now, to find the vector sum of a pair of vectors, we join them head to tail. So we can see here that by joining the tail of B, to the head of A, we get A plus B. Now A plus B is called the resultant vector, and it's colored green in this diagram. And so it's the vector joining the tail of the first vector to the head of the last vector. That is, the tail of A to the head of B in this situation. Now the vector sum of two vectors can be also be found by drawing a parallelogram. So here we have vector A and vector B, and we've drawn a parallelogram by drawing a copy of B and a copy of A over here. In this case, the resultant vector is the diagonal of the parallelogram. So moving across from the start to the end. We can see that this is equivalent to having a triangle, where we would have A plus B. Now to add more than two vectors together, we simply join each vector head to tail with the next vector. So we can see a vector polygon over here, and another vector polygon. And in each case, we're adding four vectors together to get this yellow vector, the resultant vector. The resultant vector is a line drawn from the tail of the first vector to the head of the last vector, just like a vector sum. And the order of the addition does not matter. So no matter which order you add the vectors together in, you'll end up with the same resultant vector. This is because vector addition is commutative. So here we can see in the first polygon we add A, and then B, and then D, and then C. And our resultant vector is a big yellow vector going from the top to the bottom. Here we add them in a different order. We add A, and then D, and then C, and then B. But our resultant vector is still a yellow vector going from the top to the bottom. Now a negative vector is simply a vector in the opposite direction. And we can use this to find the result of a vector subtraction. So, if for example we want to subtract B from A, we must first reverse the vector that we're subtracting. So we reverse B and that make, makes it point in the opposite direction, so it's pointing upward instead of downward. 
uh, then we simplify the vector sum of minus b and a. And so here we can see that we've joined minus b to the head of a and got the vector sum of a and minus b, which is a minus b. Now we can use vector subtraction to find the vector difference or the change between two vectors. And so if we have an initial vector and a final vector instead of a and b, then we can say that the change between two vectors is the final vector minus the initial vector. And so this gives us the change in the, ve in the vector, the thing that's changed the motion. So we can see that in this situation, for example, once again we have the blue vector having its direction reversed and then added to the final vector. And this gives us the vector change, Vf minus Vi. This concludes the theory. Uh, in this section, vector algebra, we have covered vector addition, vector subtraction, and adding multiple vectors together. Now let's go on to some questions. Which of these cannot be modeled in one dimension? Let's go through them. A, a train on a, tra on a straight track speeding up. Well, because the, tra the, the track rather is straight, the train can only move in one direction, or it can move in the other direction as well, but that's still only one dimension. Um, and so in this case, we can model this in just uh, one dimension, so it's not the answer. What about D? A rocket en route to the moon. Now a rocket only moves in one direction. You hope it only moves in one direction, that's going up. And so once again, it's, it's sort of moving in a straight line. We don't have to worry about it moving left or right or forward or backward. It's just going up. So D is not the answer. What about B? An apple being tossed into the air and caught. Now unlike a rocket, an apple goes up and then down. But this is still only one dimension because up is the opposite of down, of course. And so, this in fact is a one-dimensional situation and is not the correct answer. Our final option is C, a car speeding up and moving into the left lane. Now in this situation, we have the car speeding up, that is going forward, and we also have it moving left. Now if it's moving left, that's a different direction to moving forward. If it were only moving forward and back, it'd be a one-dimensional situation. But because we have the left-right axis involved, it's a two-dimensional situation. And so we can't model this in one direction, in, in one dimension rather. So we find that C is the right answer, because it's a two-dimensional situation. Question 2. What is the maximum number of vectors that we can add together at once? Hmm, let's go through the options. A. Vectors cannot be added together. Well, that sounds wrong. I'm fairly sure one of the things that we just covered in this section was how to add vectors together. Alright, what about this then? Only two vectors may be added together at once. Well, that seems a little close, because I can remember adding two vectors together earlier together. Uh, earlier in the section, but um, there was also another part where we added more than two. So this can't be right. Is it none of the above? Well, I'm afraid it is one of the above. I'm going to have to give that to you. So our last option is C. Any number of vectors can be added together at once. We find that this is the correct answer because we can simply join all the subsequent vectors head to tail and find the resultant vector by joining the tail of the first vector with the head of the last vector. It's called a vector polygon. Question 3. Draw the vector sum of these two vectors. Now remember, to find the vector sum, we simply join the head of the first vector, A, to the tail of the last vector, B. And the resultant vector is the vector joining the tail of A to the head of B. So here we have an animation. We have A and B moving together, and the resultant vector joining the tail of A to the head of B. Question 4. Subtract the yellow vector from the white vector, that is, find a minus b. Now, when we're subtracting something, we must first reverse it, or find the negative. So if we're subtracting the yellow vector, the first thing we have to do is find minus b. Now, minus b has the same length as b, but it's pointing in the opposite direction. So rather than pointing to the right, it'll be pointing to the left. After we do that, we can just add them together as before. So, an animation of this might look like this. We have b, first thing we do is make it minus b, and then add it to a. Here, a minus b is the resultant vector from adding a to minus b. On to the next question. Question 5. Part a. Add the vectors together in this order. a, b, c, d. Now, joining them head to tail looks like it's going to be fairly simple. 
we can simply join the tail of B to A, uh, tail of C to head of B, tail of D to head of C, and it looks sort of like an arch, something like this in fact. And so the resultant vector is drawn from the tail of A to the head of D, and it's just a left to right vector which is colored green. Now onto part B. Add the vectors together in a different order. How do the resultant vectors differ? Now the order for this doesn't really matter too much, so we'll say D, A, B, C. Well, D, A, C, B. Yeah, that looks a bit better. So, we add D to A, and that to C, and that to B, and our resultant vector is drawn from the tail of the first vector, which isn't A in this case, to the head of the last vector, which isn't B in this case. But we can see that it looks just the same as the last one. It goes from left to right. And so if we compare that to our original, which looks something like this, we see that the two resultant vectors are exactly the same. They do not differ at all. So it doesn't matter which order we add vectors together in, we'll always get the same answer. This concludes the questions. In this section, we've learned about vector algebra, specifically how to add together vectors and subtract vectors. We've also learned about how to add more than two vectors together.